I guess the way, the, the best way to start this discussion on grace, virtues, and gifts is that um, we cannot get to heaven by ourselves. We can only get there with the Lord's help and through his love. So God equips us with new powers in our souls so that we can live the life of heaven to see God face to face. These powers are really the powers of sanctifying grace that are made available to all of us through his love. Grace is a free gift of God, something which is not in our nature. It is totally given to us. Both actual grace and sanctifying grace meet this definition, but the gifts given in each of them are quite different. Sanctifying grace is something that is a life in the soul, something that is abiding in us. It indwells the soul and abides in it. Actual grace, on the other hand, is a divine energy setting the soul in motion towards a particular goal otherwise unreachable. But although sanctifying grace is always there, actual grace sort of um, comes and goes. It's sort of a sudden gust of the wind of the Spirit. So you gotta have to take advantage of it when it's offered to you. That's really the bottom line. John chapter 3 says, The Spirit breathes where He will, and you hear His voice, but you know not whence He comes and whither He goes. When the Spirit comes to you and sort of focuses something for you, prayer time, whatever, don't turn him down because you know not when it comes again. So actual grace doesn't abide in the soul. It is sort of transient. However, without this thrust of divine energy, the soul cannot take its first step towards sanctification. You look at it this way. Come to church the last three Sundays and you hear the fact that there's an announcement that says, come Monday morning at 6 o'clock to behold the man. And you say, you know, or in some cases the wives say, you know, it's a good thing for you to do. And you say, yeah, that's a good thing I ought to do. But you still have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning on Monday to make it happen. <laughs> Boy, okay. <laughs> but you understand what I mean. And there are flat some people that cannot do it. Some very good people that cannot do it. And in fact, there's some that we all, nameless, but we all know well, that on Sunday when they see me, they say, oh, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. I promise I'll be there tomorrow. And I just smile. Says, okay, well, love to have you. 
<laughs> but come Monday, and you know what? They meant it when they said, I'll be there. But on Monday morning, when the alarm goes off, they can't do it. Okay? It's just an example of what happens. Okay? The Spirit calls. That's the time to answer. Okay? Because you don't know when he's going to call again. By baptism, we're incorporated into Christ's body, the church, so that we live in him and he in us. And as we just said, if we are to live the life of heaven, we have to receive new powers in our souls which are not there by nature. And we have to receive them here on earth. We're not given a new soul. We're just given new powers to add to that soul that we have. Our intellect is given a new access to truth by faith. And the will receives two virtues. Hope, which is the desires of God in the certainty that he is attainable. And charity, by which it loves God. Faith, hope, and charity are the theological virtues. And they're defined as theological because they focused on only one being, and that's God. The object, the motivation of these virtues is God. Let's take a look at faith and hope. Faith is a theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that he has said and revealed to us because he is truth itself. That's a definition out of our catechism. Romans chapter 1 tells us that the righteous shall live by faith. But faith without hope and love cannot fully unite the believer to Christ. Letter James says, faith apart from works is dead. Hope is the virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life as our happiness placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying on the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's Catechism, paragraph 1817. And Hebrews, chapter 10, tells us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Now, hope is very, very important to us. It sort of inspires our activities. It keeps us from discouragement. It sustains us when we feel abandoned. The bottom line is it's, it preserves man from selfishness very important. St. Paul tells the Thessalonians, let us put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope 
of salvation. Now we come to charity, love. Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and our neighbors as ourselves for the love of God. Again, the definition from the Catechism, paragraph 1822. Before we go any further, we must always remember that Christ died out of love for us while we were still enemies. He didn't die for us when we were all friends. He died for us when we were still enemies. The Lord asks us to love as he does, even our enemies, to open our hearts to everyone we meet, and to love children and the poor as Christ himself. That's out of Mark, chapter 9. And especially on Valentine's Day, there is nothing that describes love better. That St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians. Now, you've heard it many times, but today, on this special day, you're going to hear it again. And all I ask you is to just listen to every line and ponder every line. He says, Now I will show you the way which surpasses all the others. If I speak with human tongues and angelic as well, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and with full knowledge comprehend all mysteries, if I have faith great enough to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give everything I have to feed the poor and hand over my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It does not put on airs. It is not snobbish. Love is never rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not prone to anger. Neither does it brood over injuries. Love does not rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices with the truth. There is no limit to love's forbearance, to its trust, its hope, its power to endure. Love never fails. There are in the end three things that last. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now remember that I told you that theological virtues have only one object, and that's God. Now we deal with moral virtues. Now the Catechism tells us that virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do good. The difference between moral virtues and theological virtues 
although it still fits the disposition to do good, is the fact that moral virtues are focused on other things and people below God. Things less than God. There are four moral virtues, and the intellect has one of these virtues, prudence. The will has the other three, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Now, the moral virtues do grow with education, deliberate acts, and perseverance and struggle. That's another way of saying the more you practice them, the easier it becomes to be guided by them. Let's take a look first at prudence and justice. Prudence is the virtue by which the soul sees the world as it actually is and our relation to it as it should be. Prudence enables the intellect to see what is right to do. St. Thomas Aquinas says, Prudence is right reason in action. Prudence is the guidance, the guide to the other virtues by setting rule and measure. And it guides the judgment of conscience. It's a definition from the Catechism, paragraph 1806. Justice, on the other hand, is the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. It's sort of a profound um, feeling, concern, that others should have their rights, and so it drives us to do something about it. Leviticus chapter 19 tells us, You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. The just man in the Bible is distinguished by right thinking and the uprightness of the conduct toward his neighbor. Temperance and fortitude concern our handling of ourselves. Temperance keeps desires within the limits of what is honorable. It is the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and really provides balance. It is temperance that aids the will to turn from the flashy, attractive things we should shun. The temperate person directs sensitive appetites towards what is good and maintains a healthy discretion. Fortitude, on the other hand, is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of good. Also out of Catechism 1808. It strengthens our resolve to resist temptations and to overcome obstacles in our lives. This is a tough tough virtue um, for me personally to, to really gather the importance of it. 
Fortitude aids the will to face what every instinct urges it to run away from. It enables us to conquer fear, even fear of death, and to face trials and persecutions in defense of a just course or of the truth. John chapter 16 tells us, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, how do we lose grace? This is probably the easiest of all of this, which is by mortal sin. A serious and deliberate choice against God's will that breaks the union between us and him, period. But it's always good to look at grace as a tree. Faith at the root, above it is hope, above it yet still is charity. And above all of the three, the leaves, branches of moral virtues and gifts and fruits. So faith, hope, and charity are the main portion of the tree, the trunk, the heart of the tree. Either faith, hope, or charity can be lost by a serious sin against it. Losing any one of them, we lose all of the tree above it but not necessarily that which lies below. A sin against the love of God need not destroy faith or hope. Hope can be lost by despair or presumption and faith by unbelief. However, charity is the life giver. Sinning against it, we lose supernatural life and sanctifying grace. We may still have faith and hope, but not saving, not life-giving. Without love, we lose the life-giving energy in us. Let me say that again. Without love, there is no life-giving energy in us. However, if a man has nothing but faith, he can still use that as a point to begin his return to God. So behold the Lamb, the Lamb who was my 